Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. Today we are at the A&B Ranch to talk with Bonnie Prestigard about her journey, her mission, and the miniature horses she has devoted herself to. Kent DC brings us the ag trends, and Lynn Kittleson takes us to a swap meet, and I sit down for a cup of coffee to talk about weed management with Dr. Jeffrey Gonzalez. All today here on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, produces ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally-owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. The Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Collaborating with businesses and entrepreneurs to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. You can learn more at auri.org. Con Tile Supply, Leroy, Minnesota and New Hampton, Iowa since 1985, supplying the market with field drain tile products, dual wall, metal culverts, septic systems, PVC and plumbing supplies. We're at the AB Ranch in Pine Island, Minnesota with Bonnie Prestigard. Welcome to Farm Connections. Thank you. What's happening here with all the miniature horses on your ranch anyway? Well, what's happening is I'm reaching our community with miniature therapy horses, and that's what I'm doing here. Well, therapy is a big word. What do you mean? Well, therapy can be all kinds of things, mm -hmm. but what I do here is basically they reach out to the, you know, whoever's going to be a part of it, like nursing home patients or um, group homes or any of those, and they, it's like when you, when they reach and pet, it's a form of reaching, which is a form of therapy. And also smiles, you know, muscles, form of therapies, and kisses, and hugs, and, you know, petting, and all those things are actually part of therapy. Well, I'm thinking that's extremely valuable in a work world that is tense, mm -hmm. stressed, and touching sometimes isn't welcomed. How do animals respond to touch? Well, these animals, the therapy horses, you know, the more they take them out, the more they start to connect with the patients. And once they have their basic and groundwork done, trained, and the more you start taking them out into the community, they actually will feel your, your feelings. And so they know exactly what you need at that time, whether just to stand and be quiet so they can just observe, or to give you a snug nudge or a kiss or allow you just to wrap your, your arms around their neck and just pat them. And so they know. Well, Pearl's the white horse behind right, us. Right. And behind Pearl is Gracie, right? Right. Grace and Mercy is her name. Perfect therapy horse, Grace and Mercy. Nice. <laughs> and they seem so well-behaved and well-groomed. Tell us about care of your animals. Well, I have, I do a lot of um, um, feeding. My feeding is very scheduled, so they get fed almost three times a day. I give them grain, you know, they also get dewormed, um, they uh, have <laughs> all their shots that they need to have, because therapy horses also have to have like, a, you know, their regular shots because they are going into a facility, so we don't want to be dragging anything in there, you know, that shouldn't be going in. So, um, and also they're groomed almost every single day, and so I do have volunteers that come and help me with that. And they also do therapy with my volunteers because the volunteers love coming out here. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful ranch. And Thank you. It looks like you've repurposed the barn. What, what used to happen here? Well, I used to have big horses. And I got into natural horsemanship training and did my big horses. And um, as that began, as I got inter introduced to the miniature therapy horses, I realized that this was an assignment I had to do to reach our community with miniature horses. I've seen such a um, need. They're so smart and they're so sociable, you know. And so because of that, I just began to start moving my bigger horses out and bringing the little horses in. And 
This is what happened. This time the little ones won. This time the little ones won. Exactly. And we've spent some time here this morning with your horses, and they've been friendly. They've been nudging. Uh, they'll nibble on your hands. No issues. Does that take something special? Yeah, they do have to have your basic and your groundwork training. Again, I learned that through, um, you know, my training. And once your your basic and groundwork is done well, you can pretty much take them anywhere, you know, because that has to be done well. And that isn't like, you know, I train them for three months and then I leave them for three months. It's it's a, a relationship. So you, they're they're my kids. And so it's a relationship, and that's where you make your connection. Just like anybody, you know, am I you know, on a high relationship or I'm mm-hmm. hanging around a relationship or I'm with you all the time relationship? And so that's the kind of feedback you'll get with your horses to how much time are you spending with your horse. From the time we've been here, I noticed they also respond to your voice. Mm-hmm. So is, are there some other things you do in training besides just using your voice? Well, actually... The horse's kingdom voices are his pressure and release and body language. And so when you begin to learn the kingdom of the horse and really know their true language, then the voice really is just an added, added connection. But actually, it's pressure and release, turning your body language up, bringing it down in your body language, which is the language of the horse. So the human has to learn the language of the horse. They want to put all the words together. But really, they don't. It isn't really a connection. It's in your body language. That's a really interesting. And you've talked a little bit about neighbors coming in, and it's part of what you do in this neighborhood. And you've also opened up your farm to other organizations. You mentioned some, but maybe some others. What, what, do, you, what do you do with this? Well, my big connection that I made up was with Season Hospice. You know, I saw them on TV um, with their pet therapy program with the dogs. And they told me all what their dogs are. And I thought, well, my miniature horses could do that. I wonder if they would accept them. Because um, they did help my mom when she was uh, passed away. And they were part of that. And I thought, maybe this would be something that I could give back to them. If they would receive it. You know, sometimes you have a goal and nobody will receive. And I did have doors closed to me. But Season Hospice opened up their door to me. And it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience with them to be able to bring the joy and the smiles and the laughter on people's faces because, you know, laughter is good medicine, and so they're kind of like medicine in a bottle. When you worked with the Seasons Group, did you do any special projects? Well, they do have what they call the sentimental journey, and that's just an awesome, awesome, neat thing. And it was Golden Cross from Rochester, Minnesota, offered their services to Season Hospice to take any of their hospice patients anywhere they wanted to go in around a 300-mile radius. So it's kind of like Make-A-Wish. So if someone wants to go to their own farm home that they hadn't seen for a long time, or a friend, or, or whatever, well, all of a sudden, here's someone want to come out to the miniature therapy horses. I was just shocked that they would want to, you know, they're sick people. These people right. are very sick. And they rode the ambulance, came in here on the gurney, we moved them right out here, right down the wall down here, and to see the smile come on their face, I mean, I can't tell you what that does to you, and their eyes light up, and, you know, sometimes you might have to hold their hands to pet them, but the presence of that joy and that goodness in our barn is just all over the place. It's just so worth it, and they're here for almost an hour because then we go into the showroom and Billy does does his little dance for them and they're laughing and not only does it minister to that that patient but also to the family because they're going through a huge transition as well and so I just love that that's Billy there and so he's ready for his debut here pretty soon (laughs) well you're certainly a sharing and giving person and I'm, I'm glad they received the gift of coming here and getting the gift you have but it sounds like you've gotten a gift from them when they're here Oh, yes. Awesome. Um, I love my horses, and I, and, and I enjoy season hospice here, too, you know, the, them being a part of our, our uh, program. Well, what advice do you give to parents and others that might wonder how to connect with you? Well, you know, we are open. Uh, you know, I have a volunteer program, and my volunteer program, I, I you know I don't take real young kids, 
But for the young kids, they can always uh, call in and we can, they can do a farm tour, a pet tour, or any of those things to do some kind of connection. But by a volunteer program, I usually like to have them 14 and older to make the uh, connection with the miniature horses. And, um, but you know, it all depends on each child too, so as they come. And so they come in here and they learn how to groom, they learn how to feed, they learn how to pick up poop. You know, it's, it's not all glory, you know, there's work to be done, you know. And, but when they do come, the miniatures connect with them because some of our kids, you know, are going through some rough times. And so when they come here, they feel the quietness of our farm. You know, we, I always play music. It's always soft music. I'm not into the rock and roll thing. I don't want my horses going like this. You know, it's very classical music. It's soft, soothing to the soul. And so when they come here, they groom the horses, and, do, and you can see them connecting. And so it's, it's just an awesome, awesome all-around deal. <laughs> You do a great job, Bonnie. Thank you for your time today. <laughs> Thank really you. Appreciate for, it. Thank you for coming. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. For the second year in a row, 2016 featured record corn and soybean yields for many producers in the upper Midwest. 2016 also had relatively low crop and livestock prices and very modest average net farm income levels in southern Minnesota based on the farm business management summary for the region. The summary includes an analysis of 1,380 farm business records of all types and sizes and is probably one of the best gauges of profitability and financial health of farm businesses in the region. The average net farm income for 2016 was $46,472, which was about 25% above 2015 levels. However, 2016 was the lowest net farm income level in the past decade. The 2016 average gross farm income was approximately 6% lower than in 2011, and cash expenses in 2016 were about 3% higher than five years ago. The net farm income is the return to labor and management after crop and livestock inventory adjustments, capital adjustments, depreciation, etc. This is the amount that remains for family living, non-farm capital purchases, income tax payments, and for principal payments on farm real estate and term loans. As usual, there is a large variation in net farm income in 2016 with the top 20% farms having a net farm income of over 228,000 and the low percent 20% farms averaging nearly 100,000 in net loss. Net, overall, net farm returns for both crop and livestock operations were positive for a majority of farm operators in 2016, but net returns were also negative for an increasing number of producers. Fortunately, the record 2016 crop yields for many crop producers helped offset the low crop price levels and livestock profit margins started to improve later in the year. The average debt to asset ratios have been increasing slightly in recent years with more rapid increases in the lower profit farms. The farm term debt coverage ratio in 2015 and 2016 has dropped below 100% which means the average farm operation did not generate enough farm income to cover the principal and interest payments on existing real estate and term loans and had to use working capital or non-farm income sources to cover that difference. The overall average health of the farm businesses remained fairly strong in 2016. However, there are caution flags on the horizons with lower working capital, increased debt to asset ratios, and extremely tight term debt coverage ratios. That's all for today. We'll be back next time with another report. Farm Connection has traveled to the event Bar and Grill in Cass, Minnesota to meet up with Dr. Jeff Gonzalez, the weed specialist at the University of Minnesota. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, what is a weed anyway? Well, the classic is it's a plant out of place, right? So that could mean a petunia and a bunch of marigolds, but we're not talking that. We're talking there's biological characteristics of weeds that make weeds weeds. And so one is dormancy. A seed can stay in the ground for an extended period of time, 
and then grow when the conditions are right. Okay, so like a corn plant, it grows, you've bred it mm -hmm. to remove dormancy, so it comes out of the ground when you want it to. Weeds come out on their own agenda, so some come out early, some come out late, and that's part of what makes weed management a challenging is they, you got to know their time schedule and how they integrate with your crop to get good weed management, and those are some of the things we talk about. Well, if a urban person or even a rural person has a plant out of place in the lawn and it's a weed, that's irritating. Yes. But what happens on a farm when weeds take over? Well, weeds cost you money. The thing with weeds that's a little different than insects and diseases is insects and diseases will like work on the, the leaf or they'll chew some of your leaves, etc. But Weeds compete with your crop for exactly the same things your crop needs, nitrogen, water, and sunlight. So it's a direct one-on-one -on -one competition. So you let them go, especially weeds that start right up when your crop emerges, you can, depending on the density of the weeds, you can lose 10, 20, 30, some weeds, 70% of your yield is lost if you don't manage those weeds. Did you say 70%? It can happen, that's correct, with, especially with some of the weeds that I think we're going to be talking about later. 70% go home, you're not making money, you're not even making the farm payment. Absolutely, and that's where one of the biggest challenges is, obviously we're always cognizant of the bottom line, economic inputs, but I think weeds, um, is especially now with the resistance issues that are coming along, this is not a place you want to skip on your inputs. And in the end then, if the farmers aren't making money, the local communi community isn't making money either. So you've, it isn't just about spending a lot of money on the inputs. The return on the investment is what we're concerned about. You mentioned resistance. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Resistance is when you use, say, a specific herbicide, in the case of herbicide-resistant weeds, and you use it too frequently, and then some of your weeds, you're selecting for those that are naturally resistant to that mm -hmm. herbicide. They produce more seed. Seed goes into the soil. The seeds have dormancy. Like we talked about, weeds have dormancy. And then they come back. And if you don't change your management practice, diversify or diversify your cropping systems, um, then what happens is over time these weeds start to gain more and more of a presence and often then you have resistance to that classic chemistry. What do we do about that? Well that's a really good question. I've been working on that problem since 1993 and uh, one of the issues that's in play is we have what? Fewer farmers, you know that, we all know that, farming more acres. So herbicides are very important tools and they're often perceived not just for their weed control but for their time labor saving. So it's really a, it's a tough little cycle to break, but some of the things we need to do is diversify our weed management practices. We need to break the cycle of some of the weeds going to seed. And in some cases, I hate to say this, but some of these we're making the case with resistant weeds because we're losing a lot of important herbicide tools. We need to go out and walk the fields again and pull weeds before they go to seed. I'm having some memories that are a little I, stressful here. I can see you. I can see it working on you, and, uh, and I see that face a lot. But let me give you a scenario, okay? So a lot of uh, your farmer audience is familiar with tall water hill. It's a pigweed species. There's many different pigweed species, but tall water hemp uh, has an ability to, over time, has been adapting to a number of different classes of herbicides. So we have some now that are resistant to three classes of herbicide. One is Roundup, which just about everybody uses. Some are what we call the PPO inhibitors, things like Cobra, Flexstar, Reflex. It's another common soybean herbicide. And then also the herbicides that were used widely in the 90s. Um, and so the problem is, there's a post-emergence when weeds are up in your soybean field, if you have a weed that's resistant to three, those three classes of herbicides, there's only one class of herbicide left that you can use post-emergence. And that requires that you have planted Liberty Link soybeans. Okay, so you're seeing a limitation of the number of herbicide options 
that is going on. And so if we just keep perpetuating the cycle and just relying on another new herbicide to solve our problem, we're just going to create more problems. So we have to break the cycle. We have to diversify our weed control. I'm not against cultivating again. Okay. I'm not, I know you got that same look that I said when we mentioned uh, pulling weeds, but I'm not against other new alternative practices. Um, crop rotations, if there's value in alfalfa, if there's value in other crops, the integration of uh, duration of cover crops on CRP land for a while maybe would be of help. Uh, because one thing we can do with some of the weeds that are most problematic for resistance is they don't live long in the soil. So our biggest problem weeds are giant ragweed, water hemp, uh, common ragweed are the big ones around here. And so we can use that to break up their life cycle. And, and that's really what we talk about when we talk about understanding the weed biology, looking for the weaknesses and exploiting them with our management practices. Jeff, you've talked about resistance and a few other things. Is there any one weed that stands out right now? Yes, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Palmer amaranth. It's related to the tall water hemp. It's another pigweed species. It's not native here, but we have a detection in Yellow Medicine in Lyon County this year that came in with some native seed plantings tied to the pollinator agenda. And uh, the pollinator species approach is, I think, very good. But what happened is I think the seed supply couldn't meet the demand, and so this was some seed that probably came from out state, where Palmer amaranth is more prevalent. It's more competitive than water hemp. It puts more, more seed. One single plant can put out a quarter to a half million seed per plant. And it also is adaptable and quite tolerant of a number of different herbicides. So what we're doing is, for the first time in my entire career, and I've been here 31 years, been in weed science 41, is eradication. And thanks to the Minnesota Department of Ag noxious weed eradicate law, uh, Minnesota Department Ag is the statutory authority to come into these sites and work on eradication. And, and I'm working with them, and so is my colleague, Roger Becker, in identifying these weeds, helping to identify them, again, exploiting the biological weaknesses of this plant, and really trying to eradicate it so it doesn't spread to our corn soybean fields, because it truly would be a devastating weed. In Tennessee, in cotton, 50% of the cotton acres down there, obviously a higher value crop, um, are hand weeded because of this weed. So if you got cringy before about <laughs> pulling weeds, you really don't want this weed. It, it's a very tough weed to control. So since we've been spoiled, maybe three or four final recommendations to farmers. One is diversify your weed management options. That includes chemistry. Number two, especially with the resistant weeds that are problems, the ragweed, giant ragweeds, the water hemp's, don't let them go to seed, okay? And number three is be timely in your applications. In other words, that's easier said than done, but really think about the fact that you need to do your weed control from planting, and you should have it all done in the bag by 4th of July. Early season weed control is effective, Later season, a lot of bad things can go on. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice talking with you. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. One of the largest swap meets in the United States was held recently in Lesur, Minnesota. Pioneer Power Association, which also holds a huge antique tractor event in August each year, played host to over 700 vendors and close to 12,000 visitors to their 40th annual event. Tom Graham is the president of the association. He was a happy man with how the event has been growing. We actually started out in 77, I, well I guess it'll be 77 if it's 40 years down at the Lesur County Fairgrounds in Lee Center. A one day Sunday afternoon event with probably 15 vendors or so and it, uh, it just took off like gangbusters and we moved out here in about 1980 and we've got 120 acres on site here and approximately 80 acres is uh, spread out with various vendors from all over the United States. What can you find at a swap meet with so many vendors? Just about anything you want, says the show president. 
if you can't find it here, you don't need it, I guess is probably the easiest way to say it. You know, it started out primarily as a tractor part situation, tractors, gas engines, and that. But you see household goods, you see CD records, you see handmade wood carvings, uh, and, uh, you know, signs and, and caps. And there's a guy over here, I just saw a sign, socks, $5 a bundle. And uh, a little bit of everything, uh, and I suppose if you're looking for the kitchen sink, you could probably find that too. Floanne Henniker is the local University of Minnesota Extension agent, and during the event, spends her time on the exhibition grounds. And it's amazing that the vendors come from many different states. Um, people uh, came in this morning from way down by St. Louis that I talked to, um, lots of states and, and other countries as well. Anyone that tells you that interest in collecting old farm equipment, tractors, and just going out and looking at antiques that's on the wane doesn't know what they're talking about. They need to come to Lesur, Minnesota, along with 12,000 other people, and see the 700 booths with just about anything you can imagine. If it was made, it's probably here. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. By training her miniature horses, Bonnie Prestigard and her A&B Ranch have provided love, laughter, and support to so many throughout the community. Once again proving that no matter how big or small we are, we are capable of great and important things. Thank you for joining us on Farm Connections. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.